Hello, Ed. It's a real pleasure to see you. Uh, I'm, um, I'm excited that you agreed to do this, and I'd like to ask you just a, a few questions. So first of all, just to start, um, you are an engineer, but you're also a neuroscientist, and your lab does computational work and experimental work and method development and application. There's two ways to see this. Number one, don't you get confused? Number two, <laughs> doesn't it feel like you're a renaissance man that's like, you know, actually embracing uh, all aspects of your personality. So what's your, what's your take on sort of, you know, working on such a diverse range of disciplines and approaches? Well, you know, what got me into this business, business in the first place was um, philosophy. You know, I, when I was a kid, I really was obsessed with questions like, what is the meaning of life? Why do we have suffering? What's the nature of happiness? And so all through my research, I was always attracted to questions at the border of philosophy and science. So my first scientific project, I went to one of these magnet schools where they take you when you're young and put you into college. Um, so I was only 14 years old. Um, was a project uh, led by a professor named Paul Braderman on creating life from scratch. We were trying to make DNA out of inorganic molecules. And that didn't work or you would have heard about it, but it was still a lot of, of fun and I learned a lot. And then I transferred to MIT where we met and I worked on quantum computing, another problem at the border of the weirdness of philosophy and the practicality of, of engineering. And that, of course, also is very hard. We still don't have very, very good quantum computers yet. And so, so what's very funny is that in ancient Greece, this concept of philosophy and science blending together was very common. Basically, the fact that philosophy sits more in literature departments nowadays rather than in mathematics and logic departments is kind of a break from the origin of philosophy, if you wish, in ancient Greece, where it was really about sort of logic axioms, you know, arguing and sort of reasoning in a very mathematical sense about all these oh, yeah. deep questions. And that way of thinking, I think, is very helpful in fields like biology, which are still more, maybe more art forms than, than post-paradigm sciences. So when I switched into brain science, it was almost like the training of my previous experiences in physics and chemistry helped me think a lot about how do we bring a technological approach to bear on, on the brain. And, uh, uh, and so that's really informed how I think about things. You know, let's start with a big problem, like what is an emotion? What is a decision? Then let's build the technologies that give us the data that we want in order to solve the problem, and let's go get the data. So it's driven by the computational ideal, but technologically enabled, and ideally getting down to what I like to call, in quotes, the ground truth. You know, if we can get to the fundamental building blocks and how they interact, can we mechanistically explain these highly emergent phenomena like feelings, like decisions that have been for a lot of human history, the domain of philosophy, but which might be within shouting distance now of where neuroscience is headed. So how, how would you quantify shouting distance? Like basically, is it, you know, a decade? Is it 50 years or is it like a few years? Well, my hope is that we can take um, some small brains starting with, you know, fish, flies, and worms, but next are mice, and then would, could we get to humans? And if we can make complete maps of them, if we can observe their dynamics, and if we can control the dynamics, can we integrate these three data sets using machine learning, for example, to make models of decisions and emotions that are both biophysically accurate and, ideally, human understandable? And so my dream is that uh, for small brains, over the next decade, we can achieve these things, and doing so will pave the way for scaling up the tools to larger brains like our brains, but also maybe the insights that we get from small brains because of evolution might apply directly to at least parts of the human brain. So there's a whole school of thought that completely dismisses animal models as totally inappropriate for understanding human because the range of emotions and the range of behaviors in human is just so much more complex. So my question to you is, do animals think about the meaning of life? Is there such a thing and and you know what is that continuum is there a discontinuity in how animals plan out their day in, in how say primates will sort of ponder in the morning what to do for the rest of the day until they get hungry and so on and so forth uh and sort of what humans do when they wake up in the morning and ponder about you know how to go about their day is there such a thing as wondering about the meaning of life in primates and other animals and by analogy, is there even such a thing in, human, in humans? In other words, we tend to attribute a lot of the behaviors, no matter how complex in, that we observe in animals, to instinct, to things that are sort of hardwired. And my question is, by the same analogy, 
is this quest for meaning in humans, perhaps also some kind of hardwired instinct that we have very little control over. So let's break down the question in two parts. So let's get to the meaning of life in a second, because that's, um, that's a topic of its own. But let's uh, confront the question of what can we learn from animals that might generalize to humans. So if we build a very simple computer chip with only a handful of logic gates, it won't be able to do very much. If we build a early computer chip, like the way that Intel did, you know, um, you know, 15 years after the transistor, it can do some computations, but nowhere near the complexity of the kinds of things that we can do now. And if you get computing to a certain scale, you know, a lot of um, the drive behind deep learning and these kinds of interesting uh, AI-like phenomena are not only due to algorithms, but it's also due to the scale of computing that's possible. You know, a lot of the ideas behind deep learning, like back backpropagation and so forth, you know, they go back 30, 40 years, um, but when computing reaches a certain scale, you can do a lot of things that you cannot do and the computing is too small a scale. So I, I would argue the following. It's very clear that the behaviors that are done by fish and mice and humans are very different. But if we can learn something about the underlying architecture of neural circuitry, and then those principles, some of them might generalize from small circuits to large circuits. And we already know that some of them do. So we know that you know, fish and, and flies and so forth, the neurons fire electrical pulses called action potentials. We know that the synapses exchange change information through transmitters. We know that certain uh, molecules act as neuromodulators, like dopamine, that can change the brain state. So uh, already there are clearly some things that generalize at the circuit level, and analogous to going from the transistor to the small microchip to the large AI-enabled Google Cloud or whatever, um, I think that uh, we can learn something about the underlying computational primitives and the processes that occur. Now, the other, the, then the question becomes what emergent patterns can occur with a given scale of computing? And that, I think, is a, is a true unknown. We'll, we'll be able to, to do things like meaning and, and advanced cognition um, with circuits of a certain scale or other unique features uh, that only emerge um, in a fundamental way when you get a certain scale that are unpredictable. So of course, you know, the halting problem that Turing um, uh, uh, proposed and evaluated says that you cannot design an algorithm that will, you know, all by itself, be able to figure out whether another algorithm halts or continues forever, right? So in some ways, computation is fundamentally unpredictable. But I would argue that's even more a reason why we should understand the underlying circuit primitives. We might have to understand them and then simulate in order to explore the space of possibility for these large brains that have such a high dimensional space of possible states, such a high dimensional space of possible trajectories in the state spaces that emerge. Okay, now back to the meaning of life. Let's talk about, let's talk about a little bit about sort of the evolutionary process that eventually led to this complex machinery. I mean, there's no doubt that in a local environment, the competition uh, for you know, access to food, for protection, for shelters, for procreation, uh, and caring for progeny, uh, clearly led to the evolution of more and more complex sensory inputs and more and more complex processing of these sensory inputs. Mm -hmm. If you look at humans and where we are, there seems to be some kind of discontinuity. In other words, you know, you, you compare primates and their behaviors to humans, there's clearly a, a very sharp step up. And you can imagine sort of small steps eventually leading to that and species that have disappeared. Or you could reason that perhaps even within the human population today and over the last, say, you know, 50, 100,000 years, there has been continued evolutionary innovation. So my question to you is, where do you see that discontinuity? Is it just a continuum from you know, primates all the way to now? Do you feel that there is a sharp gap with some lost relatives in there that may have led to these evolutionary pressures? Are there pressures that we're perhaps not aware of that have continued pushing that human brain to this extreme? Uh, or is it just an evolutionary artifact, like some kind of weird thing that happened that eventually led to human uh, cognition being so complex? Well, sometimes I wonder if it more appears to be a discontinuity than an actual discontinuity. I imagine that um, if you compare you know, ants to you know, uh, pre-animal organisms that didn't have nervous systems at all, you know, an ant seems like a sophisticated, clever machine that can organize giant colonies and achieve enormous amounts of changes in landscape and, and very complex planning, right? And then you go from ants to, let's say, you know, uh, mammals, where you know, they have you know, social interactions that are quite different. and, and you know, even more complexity in, in societies where you know, certain kinds of primates, for example, have interesting hierarchies and ways of interacting um, that might be the precursor of you know, more complex things like human civilization. 
So part of me wonders, you know, is it a continuum or is it, or is it a discontinuity? Or it might be a continuum where it just has this exponential curve. So wherever you are, it looks like a discontinuity. Because wherever you are in an exponential curve, you know, up the curve looks really, really steep, and down the curve looks, you know, much more shallow. But it's sort of an illusion in the sense that um, uh, we're, we can't see the entire curve. We only see where we are. Um, but yeah, if you think of how a mouse and an ant must regard each other, it must seem like night and day. And now, what about the last 50 to 100,000 years? In other words, if you take a human from Mesopotamia and you bring them up in you know, the culture uh, that we have today, will they be perfectly fit to adapt? Do you feel that any additional selection may have happened for our brains in the last you know, <laughs> blink of an eye in evolution, but all of human civilization? It's really hard to evaluate that because also how you're raised as a child can influence how you think. So one of my colleagues here at MIT actually, um, uh, and actually it's a bunch of people do this kind of work. They look for isolated peoples who have been cut off from civilization and try to understand their language, their number system, you know, does it lead to different ways of thinking? And there's a whole set of uh, interesting um, studies now that suggest that indeed, if you grow up reading and writing and doing numbers and describing colors in a certain way, maybe you actually think about your world in a different way. So it's very hard to decouple that nature and nurture um, dichotomy. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the thought experiment, which would not be ethical to do, would be, of course, to take two identical twins and raise them in entirely different systems of numbers and language, which, of course, nobody would ever want to do because, you know, the one who's cut off from civilization will probably not be very happy. Um, but, uh, but some of these spontaneous experiments, like in South America or in, in certain... Uh, uh, isolated communities where there have been ways of getting anthropologists and psychologists to interact with them in a way to, uh, to understand how they think have suggested that indeed uh, how you're, you're brought up might actually have a big effect on how you think about things. Yeah. So going back to your original question of whether you, you know, the thought experiment transplanting somebody from a very different civilization to another one, you know, on the one hand, it does seem like they might be, be um, uh, uh, if they're raised in a certain way, struggle to a, a change, but, but there's also a lot of human plasticity and it's also amazing how you know immigrants from one country who you know go to another one and adapt and change and we're always evolving. This whole uh, human system is so dynamic, and I think one of the most fundamental traits of humanity is how rapidly we get bored, right? So um, you know, along comes something. It's the greatest thing ever. You know, a phone with a you know, a, a touch screen and you can type on it, and it was like revolutionary. And now my kids, you know, who are six years old and nine years old, they're like, well, duh, of course, that's just how the world works. Show me something new, right? This is boring. So I think you know, one of the major drivers of human progress, in quotes, might just be our ability to get bored so easily. People want novelty. They want the next new thing. And, um, and I wonder if that novelty-seeking behavior is actually a big driver behind how people think about meaning in their lives. Um, and uh, more than any particular direction, whether it's progressive or, you know, in, or towards some goal, you know, the, the quest for the new is so inherent. To if you look at the neuroscience basis of that uh, novelty-seeking behavior, I mean, you know, you listen to a sound long enough, eventually your brain starts blocking it out. You uh, wear, you know, orange ski goggles for long enough, your brain eventually, you know, washes that out. Um, is novelty-seeking behavior explainable in similar sort of low-level ways, or is there some sort of higher-level circuit where that novelty, you know, is encoded and where these past get blasé as time passes by? Yeah, so in, in, this is actually a very popular behavior to study in mice. It's called the novel object recognition test. So you can show a mouse um, an object, and after a while it'll get bored. If you swap it with a new object, then its behavior will change very rapidly. And then also eventually there'll be a time course. And you can actually evaluate these things mathematically and, and fit them with equations. So I think, I wonder if there is actually a circuit in the brain that is, is looking for novelty. You know, novelty can be both a plus, oh, here's interesting opportunity, but also it can be danger, you know oh, I, I should be wary of this because it could be bad for me. And so I think novelty is um, a great proxy for uh, you know, the need to pay attention to something because mm -hmm. it could be good, good for you or it could be bad for you. I don't know if people have studied this in, in worms or fish or flies yet. So that, uh, that might be interesting. What's the, the smallest brain that has a, a, a novelty-seeking change? Mm -hmm. But even worms with only 302 neurons, if you expose them to the same mechanical stimulus over time, they will acclimate to it. So that's sort of interesting to think that even with only a handful of brain cells, you know, one of the most prominent behaviors is, you know what, you might want to ignore something if it's getting boring for you.
Now that gets us to uh, kind of a, a mystery of neuroscience, which is the fact that different types of activities appear to be encoded in different areas of the brain. There's a visual cortex, there's an auditory cortex, you can actually map stimuli, sensory stimuli from different parts of the body to different parts of the brain, which suggests some kind of modularization. Uh, by contrast, you have this incredible complexity in the way that memories are stored, where multiple neurons appear to be involved, sometimes engaging multiple areas of the brain. So my question to you is, uh, which area of the brain, or what type of circuitry, would be encoding our quest for meaning, and maybe even meaning itself as we start, you know, finding it. So is that, so, and you know, could you comment a little bit on this whole sort of partitioning versus globality and sort of multi-regional network connections? Yeah, I think the more we learn about the brain, the less modular it looks. So one of my, my favorite odysseys in neuroscience is, was one that was launched by a couple of MIT groups. And they were recording in the visual cortex, just a couple synapses in from our retina uh, in our eyeballs. And um, they were studying very subtle properties of the behavior, and they found that neurons in the visual cortex would actually respond with emotional cues. So this flies in the face of the old modularity theories that go back half a century, um, which, selected that, which suggested that neurons should respond to edges or colors and so forth. And the more people look, they find more and more these things. A group in New York City has found that in the auditory system uh, and the visual system, there's crosstalk between these two areas. And in a paper that um, a bunch of us were involved with, led by Li Wei Sai, that just came out a couple days ago, um, combining visual stimuli and auditory stimuli in the right way can actually get molecular changes throughout most of the brain. So maybe the brain is not as modular as we think. Maybe it's just that modularity was the first draft, our approximation, because it was easy to test very simple stimuli, like a moving bar of light or a signal single tone. But as you get more and more complex mixtures of stimuli, you start to see these very nonlinear interactions. So going back to your question of meaning, first I have to wonder if we have to define what meaning is. And actually, before I was getting ready this morning, I was thinking, you know, as a, as a scientist, I love to ask questions in a way where either answer is interesting. And so I started wondering at the following, is it better to feel like you're living a meaningful life or to actually be living a meaningful life, but not feel it. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, I was like, well, this is sort of interesting. You know, a lot of people talk about colloquially the idea that you create your meaning, right? Meaning is created. You find your meaningful path. You discover what makes meaning for you. So that sounds awfully like the feeling of meaning is what is important. But to me, it sort of struck me as a little bit worrisome. What if I feel that I'm being meaningful and I'm going around doing something terribly useless, like, I don't know, counting toothpicks all day on my front lawn, um, is that really meaningful? So then I started thinking about this more. And I was like, well, let's suppose that we feel like we're having meaning, and that's what matters. And let's suppose that we are trying to achieve meaning, even though we don't feel meaning. In both cases, understanding how the brain creates the feeling of meaning, uh, creates the feeling of meaning is a relevant question. Suppose that the feeling of meaning is what matters. Well, then understanding how the brain creates that feeling is important, because if I can create that feeling for things that are actually beneficial to other people, rather than me counting toothpicks on my front lawn, that would be good to know. And then let's consider the other answer to the question. I want to live a meaningful life, but you know what, I'm not feeling meaningful. Well, if we understood how the brain creates the feeling of meaning, maybe I would be a lot happier because I would live a meaningful life and actually feel like I was living a meaningful life. So again, I love questions where either answer is interesting. And of course, it's not just a dichotomy. You can imagine more complicated versions of the question. But it made me start wondering, what we need to do is maybe to map out a couple things. First is the feeling of meaning. What parts of the brain, and again, we, it might not be modular, so what patterns in the brain occur during the feeling of meaning? I don't think to my knowledge, I haven't done a detailed study in the literature, but I'm not sure people have actually looked at in the human brain what occurs when people feel the feeling of meaning. The second is the cognitive aspects of meaning, right? I might be planning a meaningful life even if I don't feel it's meaningful. And there's sort of this higher order cognitive aspect. I want to do this because I think it's meaningful. It's gonna benefit my fellow humans. It's gonna be better for the earth. It's gonna be better for health and happiness. And, um, and deconstructing the cognitive aspects might also be very interesting. So I think what, to summarize, what we call meaning might be multiple things. The feeling of meaning, the cognitive planning of meaning, maybe the social aspects of meaning. You know, some parts of meaning might only be obvious or perceptible when a group of people are together. You'll look at what happens during a disaster like a hurricane. People team up and band together um, 
you know, it's so different in some ways than what people do in their everyday life. And people afterwards sometimes describe the experience as transformative. You know what? Our community banded together. We fought this disaster. We overcame it and became stronger. And some of that is rhetoric, but some of that I think cuts to a deep aspect of the human experience, which can only be appreciated through collective action. Uh, now, and there's always... We live in an era of... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, that was the end of my there's, there's only so many hours in the day. And um, if we start thinking, let's do the thing that is meaningful regardless of how we feel about it, you might actually start saying that perhaps we're going to partition the types of activities to different individuals. And perhaps, you know, any time you spend with your children is a waste of time. You should just pay, instead pay someone to do that. And even though it makes you feel meaningful and it makes them feel great about it, maybe your time, you know, now that you've achieved a certain amount of expertise in your size, should be spent only during your size. And we as a society will decide that that's the most meaningful thing for you to do, even though we can now decouple that from your own feelings of meaning, you know, meaningfulness. So my question uh, a little bit, you know, pushes that argument to the extreme and basically says, great, suppose that someone could tell us what is meaningful. How do you draw the line? Is balance yeah. part of that meaningfulness for each person? At least a half dozen people have actually asked me, wow, you're directing one of the largest neuroscience groups on earth and you're cranking out technologies a lot. Is it having kids holding you back? And, you know, because it's a, it's a lot of time to take care of children and my wife is also a neuroscientist and travels, and, and so you know that, that means additional time spent with the children. I thought about it a lot, and, I, and I, in my perspective, I actually think it's very synergistic because in biology, it's very rare to find a biology problem where somebody working all by themselves solves the entire thing, right? And if you look at all the great biotechnologies of our time, they were all developed by teams of people. And so what I actually thought about a lot is you know what, I actually think that these different aspects of meaning in my life, and maybe it's just luck, um, seem pretty well aligned. And you know, raising children and, and learning how to interact with them and teach them and get them to do what you want them to do, <laughs> these are actually really good skills for managing teams and, you know, and, you know, uh, and, and understanding how human dynamics occurs and, and emotion and, and so forth. So maybe it's just, you know, I got lucky that you know, my, my day job and my, my personal life aligned well. Um, but certainly I can see lots of examples where it might not align. You know, in mathematics, where a lot of people do their best work all by themselves in an attic working for 20 years. You know, um, that maybe there's a, more of a tension in, in some people's minds than others. But, uh, but it's a good question. And, and one of the goals that, uh, that different ways of thinking, different social structures play in the individual's choice. You know, I think that's one of the big questions of our time, especially when what works for one person, like using energy to do something, applied to billions of people could lead to ecological catastrophe, for example, right? So this tension between individual action and collective action, which you know, goes back, of course, many centuries, if not millennia, I think we're especially feeling the impact now because the kind of impact that you can have as an individual, both positive and negative, can be quite large. And if you scale up that to a large number, then it can be even more magnified. Yeah, so you actually found synergy in your own line of work between family life and work, but you know, your questioning is mathematics the same way. And, and I would argue that many mathematicians have said that, hey, their best ideas came in the shower. So uh, there's no way that we can think of taking a shower as synergistic with mathematics. But sure. maybe it's the fact that it is in those moments where you're not actively working that your brain has finally the time to think about sort of longer term kind of questions rather than solving short term problems at a time. So I would argue yeah. that perhaps even for mathematicians, these types of balanced activities might be beneficial. Oh, yeah. Well, for me, one of the most powerful things to sprinkle throughout my thinking is sleep. I often find that if I load my brain up with a lot of stuff right before I sleep, when I wake up, my brain has reconsolidated those bits of information into interesting insights or designs. And, um, and actually, this turns out not to be just uh, an N of one. It turns out that a study was done by a group in Germany where they showed that a nap or, or sleeping, I forget the exact amount of time they had to sleep, would multiply the chances of having a flash of insight by a factor of three over if you didn't take a nap or sleep. So yeah. there seems to be something in the brain where um, maybe insight, and that all, that's another component of meaning, right? This feeling of meaning is often linked to an insight or a, a transformation in thinking, um, might be facilitated by things that we have no conscious understanding of how it happens and, and what's going on inside during it.
Now, you don't have to answer positively to this, but it seems like almost everything you're describing has somehow streamlined your daily activity and your life's activity into productivity. Are there some things that you do that you're like, oh no, that's clearly a waste of time and I should stop doing that? Or do you feel that you, know, you have somehow achieved the right balance where there's no such activities left in your day? Well, I kind of treat my life as an experiment. And I even treat our scientific group at MIT as an experiment on how to do science. So I'm always playing with the formula and trying to understand, is there a better way to do things? I mean, in 2018, I travel a lot. I must have traveled once a week, you know, something like 50 trips. In 2019, I'm, I'm barely traveling. You know, I think I've gone on a, a couple of journeys since the beginning of the year, and now we, here we are a quarter way through the year. Um, and I think it's important to play with the process of life, you know, because things change. And what works well at one point in your life might be a disaster at the point of my life. In my own life, I think a lot right now about how to scale up science. You know, how do we take what we do in science and, and make it magnified? Both to be more involved with the people throughout the world. There's a lot of talent that cannot you know, come to a, a small place like MIT, which in the grand scheme of universities is not a very big place. But also, the problems are so big and so daunting. Health and energy and, and biomedicine. I mean, a lot of these problems are so difficult. How do we actually scale up our ability to do science as a human population? And, um, and so that's one of the reasons why I've been kind of spending less time traveling and more time trying to think about how do you build communities and are there tools we can build that can spread science and not just the knowledge of science, but the participation in science in ways that are scalable, inclusive, empowered, and impact driven. I feel like I've, I've been avoiding the question uh, since the beginning of the interview. So here it is, uh, in two or three minutes, or even five minutes, um, could you describe just the meaning of life for you? Basically, you know, what would be your answer if somebody asks you, hey, Ed, what is the meaning of life? Well, for me personally, um, over the last 20 years, it's been very much about how does the brain generate the mind? And even before I got into neuroscience, I was very interested in that philosophy science intersection. I think for me, the, the undercurrent that's been driving me ever since I was a child is, you know, the human condition is, is, a, is a difficult one. There's suffering. We don't understand, you know, what we do. We often do things that hurt ourselves or others. And so for me, what I really hope for in a, in a single word is, is enlightenment. Can we understand how to lead a life? Can we understand what meaning is? Can we understand why we do what we do? And, and can we make our decisions better? So my long-term hope is if we can understand how the brain generates the mind, how we make a decision, how we feel an emotion, it would give us a handle over some of these things that right now are mysterious and uncontrolled and that are buried deep in our unconscious and that we don't have conscious access to. So that's my hope is that if, let's say the, the next decade, we can really understand how the brain generates the mind in small brains and then we can scale it up to the human brain. Could that help us understand how to lead better lives? And in the, in the short term, um, my hope is that if this research works, can we understand and just give names to the processes in our mind that are where the brain generates decisions and emotions. Giving something a name can be very empowering. Look at the destigmatization of mental illness, right? It used to be that somebody who was mentally ill, maybe be locked up in a cell, but even giving it a name, this isn't you, it's not your fault. This is a thing that, you know, um, is, is disturbing and, and distressing and, and not pleasant, but it doesn't define you. It's not your problem. It's not your fault that, that, that led to this. That's helped a lot to bring mental illness into, and it's still an ongoing process. I don't think we're, we're done, but, but into a, a place of, of uh, understanding in our human society, very different than, let's say, 150 years ago. And people can talk about depression and bipolar disorder and so forth um, and realize that it doesn't make them a, a bad person. It's this thing that afflicts them. You know, what if we could understand the brain at that level, where we can give names to the processes within, and that allows us then to say, hey, I know where this impulse is coming from, but I don't have to let it define me. I think that would be itself a, a pretty big revolution. But beyond that is the field of augmentation. Now, right now, human augmentation is a hot topic. People are trying to stimulate brains to boost athletic performance, for example. But I think that if we, need, if we understood at a much deeper level what we want to do, our goal, we can augment ourselves towards that direction. You know, there's this difference between efficacy and efficiency. You know, efficiency is let's go faster in that direction. Efficacy says let's pick the right direction and then go there. And I really worry that in some parts of human augmentation, we're seeing speed 
and efficiency dominate over efficacy and, and thought. So my hope is if we can actually understand, if we can be enlightened, if we can understand where we want to go as a species, and then head in that direction of augmentation, maybe we could have more empathy. We could understand ourselves better. We could understand what causes suffering and what makes us happy and ultimately achieve more meaningful lives. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Ed. I really, really appreciate it.